125 years ago, on June 23, 1887, the original Canadian Society of Civil Engineers received royal assent for its charter. A few days later, Thomas Coltrane Kiefer was named founding president, and Kazimir Zowski, John Kennedy, and Walter Shanley were the vice presidents. Our profession was recognized in Canada, like our counterparts in Great Britain, with the Institution of Civil Engineers, and to the south, with the American Society of Civil Engineers. From an initial number of only 288, membership grew, and by 1910, it numbered nearly 3,000, and there were branches of our society from coast to coast. Canada was also growing, transforming from a rural agrarian to an urban industrial society. Railways, dams, irrigation projects, and industries were being built, and engineers were prominent figures in that growth. Engineering became Canada's largest profession of that time period. Into the early part of the 20th century, the proportion of younger, university-educated engineers grew within the society, and around the midpoint of World War I, it became apparent that a more responsive society was needed. Specific disciplines of engineering were emerging, and in April 1918, the Society's charter was amended, changing the name to the Engineering Institute of Canada. Though the original CSCE included all disciplines of engineering outside of military engineering, this new name was required so that all disciplines were seen to be represented. Canada was hit hard by the Great Depression. Unemployment was 30% by the latter years, and the Institute established a non-active list for unemployed members, as well as a free-to-members employment service. Nearly 700 members were unemployed, and the membership dropped to 3,800 from over 5,000 in 1924. Make-work projects such as the Broadway Bridge, a National Historic Civil Engineering site, employed some members. It took World War II to bring Canada out of the Depression. Support for the war effort meant increased manufacturing, resource development, and research in a number of areas. The British Commonwealth Air Training Plan resulted in the construction of over 100 new airfields and the improvement and expansion of many more. The plan laid the foundation for Canada's air transport infrastructure for years to come. As Canada emerged from World War II, thousands of veterans returned home, many ready to work, and a large number of them swelling the ranks of engineering schools in Canada. There was also a massive influx of immigrants, and this put pressure on a somewhat neglected infrastructure system. A major construction boom began. New oil was discovered in Alberta in 1947, and work began on the Trans-Canada Highway in 1949. Adding to this boom was an influx of immigrant engineers in the 1950s and early 1960s. Infrastructure was being constructed across our nation, and in 1959, the St. Lawrence Seaway opened. In Canada's north, aided in part by John Diefenbaker's Roads to Resources program, roads were constructed to access resource-rich areas. Among them was the Dempster Highway and the nearly 500-kilometer Great Slave Lake Road from Enterprise to Yellowknife. New communities such as Inuvik were being built. Membership in our institute grew, especially in the decades following World War II, but the institute faced a challenge similar to that faced by the society years before. Specialized learning societies were beginning to fragment the traditional engineering disciplines, and the Institute responded by encouraging the formation of technical divisions. By the late 1960s, support was being given to the technical divisions to form autonomous constituent societies under the Institute's charter. The Canadian Society for Civil Engineering emerged in June 1972, and with a slight alteration of the original name, the CSCE was now inclusive to all those engaged in civil engineering. The newly reformed CSCE also brought a number of the technical divisions with it, and they led the way in international relationships such as the International Association for Bridge and Structural Engineering Conference in Vancouver, hosted by the Structural Division in 1984. This was an apt location, considering the number of bridges and challenges that area possesses. Since the 1970s, the Institute and the Society have worked to record and preserve Canada's engineering heritage. 
In 1983, the Society began recognizing the historic works of civil engineers, and at the Centennial of Engineering as a Profession in 1987, outstanding Canadian engineering achievements during the previous 100 years were commemorated. Several with a large degree of civil engineering involvement, the CPR Transcontinental Railway, the St. Lawrence Seaway, the Athabasca Commercial Oil Sands Development, and the Hydro-Quebec Very High Voltage Transmission System. For the 125th anniversary, a new award for governmental leadership in sustainable infrastructure has been established by the Society, and the Institute is recognizing a number of engineering achievements. The CN Tower, the Triumph Accelerator, Confederation Bridge, Radar Sat 1 and 2, and the Canadarm. As engineers, the public depends upon the accomplishments and impacts of our profession on almost a daily basis, from those constructed decades ago to ones that are newly completed. They are beneath our feet, they are across our nation, and they are in the skies above us. May our next 125 years prove as rewarding as the last.